Now, O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. In the name of Jesus, amen. We use this word, worldly, and we really use it in two distinct senses. Merriam-Webster identifies in his dictionary these two definitions. One, worldly, having a lot of practical experience and knowledge about life and the world. Worldly. And two, of or relating to the human world and ordinary life, rather than to religious or spiritual matters, worldly. And we see both senses of this word worldly at work in Pontius Pilate, in the Jewish leaders, the chief priests, and even the crowd, and in the Roman soldiers as they look at Jesus through worldly eyes. In the Roman Empire, you didn't rise to the level of power and prestige that Pilate enjoyed without being worldly wise. As the governor, titled Pontius, keeping your job, let alone your life, really depended on the emperor knowing your ongoing worth, which meant, above all, you looked out for number one and nobody else. Pilate was a man with worldly desires and ambitions. Pilate was also worldly in the sense of personally not caring about religious matters. So, being the governor of Judea, of a group of people, the Jews, who were highly religious, well, that was a bit of a thorn in his side. Pilate and his peers regularly pursued a purposeful policy of persecution and provocation against the Jews, the people of God. And given all of that, it is a bit surprising that Pilate basically is cooperating with the Jewish leaders in the trial of Jesus. It is true that Pilate thought Jesus was innocent. Not only from his own investigation, but also a warning from his wife's mysterious dream. But Pilate in his worldliness, won out in the end. His religious skepticism was on full display when he asks Jesus, what is truth? Thus, rejecting the beaten and bloodied truth standing right there in front of him. And his practicality in worldly affairs is again on full display as Pilate tries to keep down the civil unrest, granting the Jews the execution of Jesus and the freedom of a wicked man named Barnabas. Sorry, Barabbas. Not the right guy. Barabbas. Better, Pilate knew, to pacify the Jews rather than place his position of power in jeopardy. His job was to keep the peace. Better than to not give the Jews a reason for rebellion over this insignificant Jesus of Nazareth who some called their king. 
the leaders of the Jews, they had worldly eyes as well. The Sadducees saw the popularity of Jesus as a threat to their power, a power they only enjoyed by compromising their faith with the Romans. The Pharisees, they saw Jesus as a competitor, a competitor for their own religious influence. Of course, he was an opponent to their very legalistic theology. And so the worldly Jewish leaders stirred up the crowds and demanded the crucifixion of Jesus. Finally, there were the Roman soldiers. The Roman soldiers who looked at Jesus with worldly eyes. What else could they do? They knew a king when they saw one. Many of these soldiers had seen Caesar. If not, they had probably seen kings from the east during military campaigns or even visiting dignitaries coming through Judea on their way to Rome. They knew the, the pomp and circumstance that came along with being king. But this Jewish carpenter from the backwater town of Nazareth? I mean, even the Jews would tell you nothing good comes from Nazareth, let alone kings. They knew what royalty looked like. And this man, beaten and bloodied and wearing a crown of thorns? <laughs> Hail, King of the Jews! They're bowing down and praising Jesus. It was all mockery. Ironically, Pilate and the soldiers actually got it right. Regardless of what was in their hearts or in their minds, they correctly called Jesus King. King of the Jews. But as Jesus told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. Rather, he is the king who has come from heaven to bear witness to the truth. He is the king. Thank you very much. And here is the truth. Jesus was and is king full of grace and truth, but He's not a worldly king. He's a heavenly king, a divine king. He is God in the flesh. And while the way of the world is looking for power and glory in rulers that comes with riches and, and pomp and show, the God of truth glories in the suffering of His Son. The king glories in the cross and in the empty tomb. He shows his power to save in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Crucified and risen for you. Crucify him, the crowds chanted. Yes, crucify him. The Father spoke from his sapphire throne. Crucify me, cried out the Son in obedience. St. John says, whoever does the will of God abides forever. And this, first and foremost, refers to Jesus himself. He came from heaven to do the Father's will. He came to draw all men to Himself on the cross. He came to bear the sins of the masses, dying for the life of the world. For this is how God loved the world that He gave 
His only Son, in order to reconcile the world to Himself, not counting the trespasses of the world against them. So let me ask, was His death for you? Well, let me help you answer that question. Are you in the world If you need some help answering, you just go ahead and pinch yourself real quick. Did it hurt? Then you're in the world. You have flesh on. That means you're in the world. Then yes, His death is for you. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And if your worldly sins are on Him, on the cross... That means they're no longer on you. If your sins are placed on Him in in baptism, if your sins are taken from you in absolution, if your sins are covered over in the blood of Christ shed for you, given for you, received in the Lord's Supper, then you you should consider them to be as far from you as the east is from the west. Now, last time I checked, that's pretty far. You, you who are in Christ, you can consider your sins drowned in the deepest depths of the sea. Actually, it's as if those sins are no longer even in the world. Which means you need not be burdened by guilt and shame that comes from sin. Because that is the truth of the Gospel. In Christ You have been set free from sin and death and the devil and hell. And you, you can look forward to the eternal righteousness, to the everlasting life, to the resurrection in God's eternal kingdom. Because He is a king. But His kingdom's not of this world. And as Jesus says, because his kingdom's not of this world, so you are not called to a worldly mindset. You are called to a heavenly one. St. Paul writes to those who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection, if you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on earthly things. For you, you have died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear in glory. Jesus prayed to His Father for you on the night when He was betrayed. Father, I have given them Your Word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world. But I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Satan, the evil one, would lead you to share the world's view. That you would see with your eyes a postmodern viewpoint that, oddly enough, is rightly expressed by Pilate in the ancient world. What is truth? Which, quite frankly, 
is a hopeless and completely lacking in truth point of view. But you know the truth. You know the truth, and you know the truth about the world. St. John writes, All that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of possession, it is not from the Father, but it is from the world. And the world is passing away with all of its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. And this is God's will for you. That you embrace the truth of the cross. For this is the way in which the world has been crucified to you. And you have been crucified to the world. This, this is how God saved you. This is His saving way. No matter what your worldly status may be in this fallen creation. St. Paul writes, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are so that no human might boast in the presence of God. And because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who has become to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that as it is written, Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Lord, help us keep our eyes on you. Amen. 